Thank you very much for joining us, Michael and Tolu Lope. So, Michael, I want to start with you. Now, I want to make the link between Israel and African nations. The historical relations haven't always been smooth, but now it's at a level where it's a little bit more stable. Um, Israel has diplomatic presence in most African nations. So I want to start by asking you, what inspired your decision to work throughout Africa? Because you've lived across the continent from uh, West Africa to um, other parts of the continent. And how was that influenced by the relations between Israel and parts of the continent? Uh, thank you so much. So uh, I see Israel and Africa as really sharing a lot of the history. In terms of uh, Israel became independent in 1948, Ghana, the first African country to decolonize, happened in 1957, just nine years later. So initially there was a lot of the um, collaboration and knowledge sharing. And if you think about this, the tourists among you, you look at Israel and you might see an underperforming Denmark. But really, we're like an overperforming Tunisia. Um, this Israel isn't a European country. So when I talk to Africans and I'm Jewish, I need to explain what a Jew is. And it's very hard for Europeans and Americans to get me. It's a religion, it's a culture, it's an ethnicity. And Africans get me because it's a tribe. Um, so that's the space where I'm coming from. Unfortunately, the relations have been cut, but really I think uh, that Israel and Africa started, and African nations that decolonized in the 50s and 60s started roughly at the same time. And there's a lot we can learn from each other's experience. Yeah. yeah. And can you give us a sense of just how successful ZAP's approach is? So using AI to eradicate malaria is a pretty innovative concept in, in and of itself. How successful has that approach been to date? And how has that success in reducing rates of malaria in the communities you work with helped um, to advance those communities socially and economically? Okay, so malaria is a huge burden um, in Sub-Saharan Africa. It's also a huge burden in Southeast Asia, but Africa, it costs more lives. 90% of malaria deaths happen in Sub-Saharan Africa. It also costs about 12% of GDP to an average country which is a huge, huge financial burden. It's children who are unfortunately dying, adults who are not going to work or missing school. It's a huge burden. What ZAP is trying to do is it's trying to use the method that was used here in Israel. So Israel was a malaria-infested country. When the British ruled here, they estimated that the population can't go over one million because of all the malaria. We're now nine million, and malaria has been eradicated in the 60s. The way we've done it is we treat water sources where mosquitoes uh, breed. And uh, the WHO, for a variety of reasons, doesn't recommend this approach in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, they don't believe that there's government capacity to do it, and they believe there's too many water sources. So with AI, we can predict where those water sources will occur and treat them and recreate what was done in Israel, in Egypt, in Greece, in Florida, and eradicate this deadly disease. Now, Tolu Lope, your work is more important than ever. As a PhD student at Stanford yourself, uh, you said you started Coders of Color to, for a younger version of yourself. And now you've gone on to inspire so many more young people, black young people and people of color trying to move into the tech space. So can you tell us a little bit about some of the aspirations you're hearing from young people that you work with? How are our future tech leaders seeking to change the world? Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you for your question, Isabel, and thank you to Forbes for having me. Um, yeah, working with young people is great. Um, and what's special about working with young people who used to be systematically shut out of accessing such opportunities is that they have unique experiences um, that they can draw from, uh, which are naturally innovative because people have not been um, highlighting them previously. Um, so we have young people who really just want to you know, continue their education and get formal education in computer science. We have others that are entrepreneurial um, and want to use their backgrounds or support them. We had a young person who um, wanted to build an app for his mom's business, um, which was to do with food. Um, and we have others that just want to kind of switch careers and, and go into the industry that way, um, stemming from their own prior experiences. So. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, definitely. And one of the important aspects of Coders of Color is trying to bridge that digital divide, which we witnessed more than ever just how stark that is during the pandemic, for example, the switch to remote learning. 
Um, so how successful has your drive to close that digital gap been? And eventually, what is your vision? Because I know you work to connect companies who have spare hardware, like laptops, for example, with individuals and families who don't have them or who need broadband, for example. Yeah, um, we managed to do that um, early last year, um, coinciding with the short notice of a lockdown um, being announced in the UK, meaning a lot of children would not be able to um, have personal machines and, and access education that way. Um, since we started, we've had a lot of interest from, from corporates who say they have a bunch of spare machines or say they have weird policies that lead to perfectly good machines not being in use. Um, so hoping to scale that up and um, really reach as many young people who deserve to have the access to technology that we all do in this room. Yeah, and you're uh, also helping to bridge the digital divide, but also the racial wealth gap. And we know that although there's a long way to go in the tech industry, it is uh, one of the best paid industries out there and it's helping a lot of young people of color going into the industry to build wealth and secure their financial futures. And that's obviously ties in very importantly to the work you do. Um, can you tell us some of the, the stories uh, of some of the young people you work with about how they're aspiring to also secure their financial futures uh, with the work you do? Yeah, absolutely. We have a wide range of, of people that we work with. We have the young people that come into our programs to learn technical skills and go on from there. We've had a volunteer actually have so much fun with the kids that she taught herself to code and got her first um, role in tech um, through us as well. Um, and we had someone else who had had assistance entering the tech industry and wanted to switch um, and had their salary go up by 250% um, by getting a, a new role. Um, through us, so it's helped change um, tax brackets, it's helped change um, quality of life, and um, we hope for that to continue, and we hope more corporates with good environments can do that. And one thing I do want to flag, though, um, is that these people need to go into environments that are safe for them and environments that they're respected in, um, and so we're still waiting on retention. Um, the, the current company that we work with quite well um, have, seen, have seemed to be good, um, but we do have stories of companies where people don't stay there more than one or two years because they don't feel respected or they don't feel like they can be themselves at, at work. So if there's anyone here who's interested in um, having a diverse group of people in their company, please be aware that they're humans and they have their own um, personalities and, and ways of living that you may not be used to um, and that you need to respect to retain such employees. Now, 2021 was a record year for VC investment uh, globally, but uh, particularly um, across Africa in terms of the, the growth stage. And um, I want to know from both of you, uh, why do you think investors are now paying more attention, increasing attention to the continent? You know, why are they pouring money into South Africa, into Nigeria, into Kenya in a way that uh, they weren't paying attention before? And we'll start with you, Mihai. Uh, sure, so thank you. Uh, I think they realize that Africa is the future in the sense of Nigeria has 200 million people. It's huge. Lagos has 27 million people. It's like a country. Um, so I think that's part of it. But I think there's also a difference between the way the money is spent. So some of the money goes to support local companies which are innovating. That's great. That money does good and that money will probably bring good returns. A lot of that money, however, goes into bringing global companies into Africa um, with Western managers, etc. And to be honest, I worked for one of those as well. Um, but unless you adapt it to a local context and have locals who know the market run your business, it's not, uh, not going to go well. So your Bolts, your Ubers, your whatever it is, a lot of money goes this way. Um, and I don't think that's actually helping uh, African entrepreneurs because it drives out local competitors who know the market better but may not have the means to succeed. Yeah, just to double check, what was the question again? Yeah, so wh why do you think that investors are now paying more attention um, to the continent? Okay, cool. I echo all of Mikhail's um, statements. Um, I think they do see numbers and they do see population and they do realize these people um, have access to technology and you know things they were maybe ignorant about people on the continent not having access to before um, and just see that as a financial opportunity. Um, but as Mikhail said, um, you know, these people, 
these people um, have their own lives and their own, own ways of living, as I've mentioned before, in a different context. Um, and so they are the best people to solve those problems. And as long as people invest in, in those that are best fit to solve those problems, um, hopefully it's a win-win for everyone. Um, but that would be uh, my word of caution. So basically everything Michael just said. <laughs> yeah, and, and you both... Uh, <laughs> you both touched on this um, a little bit, but um, we spoke previously about big tech kind of expanding its footprint across the continent. For example, Google recently expanding in Kenya, for example. Um, how do you think that big tech can work harmoniously with homegrown startups? Do you think they can work together? Do you think that big tech will hinder the growth and innovation of African minds and companies? Uh, what's your view on that, Michael? So I think Google is actually doing something really good because they're hiring local developers. In the first stage, it's going to drain some from the local companies. That's a fair assessment. But the biggest problem that I think African entrepreneurs have, and I think people in this room know, there's usually a gap between people who can run a business and people who know how to get investor money. And very rarely are those the same person. In Africa, that gap is even more pronounced because they don't have the lingo, they don't have the networking, and there's always the doubt. So I think African entrepreneurs who work for a large conglomerate that doesn't try to develop necessarily a competitor for an African product, but just be a Google developer and live in Kenya, will get this network, the skills, and the lingo that will enable them to start the next, I don't know if Google, but the next big company um, in Kenya and Ghana. Um, as someone who primarily works with people who want to be employees, I think big tech um, does have employment opportunities for those who are, you know, willing to work for these people. It's important that pay is, is you know, um, as good as it would be in the West. Um, and I think that's a great and kind of easy opportunity um, to have people trained in technical skills and have them work at these companies um, being paid a, d a decent wage. Um, I, that's how I see things. Um, and then speaking about championing, I want to switch gears a little bit and ask you both, which black-led or owned startups are you uh, really kind of championing at the moment, really excited about, that you think we should all be watching out for? And I'll start with you, Tolu Lopez. No, okay, okay, okay. Um, this is where I just shout out all my friends and support system, <laughs> which is all the wonderful black women um, who also run businesses that have supported me along this journey. So it might be long, please um, <laughs> bear with. Um, so first person I can think of is Deborah Okinla that runs um, Your Startup, Your Story, um, which helps uh, diverse entrepreneurs kind of have a support system. Um, Charlene Hunter runs Coding Black Females, which is a large um, network for black women who want to learn to code. Uh, Dr. Nakima Steffelbauer runs Found Loop, which teaches um, refugee women primarily actually to code and help them um, get onto the job ladder um, in Germany. Oh my gosh, there are other people that I'm having a mind blank, so I'm going to move Oscar's on to this music. <laughs> <laughs> Mikhail, what about you? Okay, first I'm going to plug in a company I'm invested in, AfriSox, uh, started by a Ghanaian friend named Huzaif. Uh, they're trying, we're trying to start the first sock factory in West Africa, and it has really cool socks and ties. Um, separately, uh, there's a friend, her name is Abena, she runs also a cool e-commerce company called Wear Ghana. They make cool hoodies. Uh, which are acceptable for Western climates. So I, as weather gets warmer, I encourage you to get this. Uh, two more guys, um, Sesenum, he developed something called SnooCode, S-N-O-O -O code. Um, and it solves one of the major problems in Sub-Saharan Africa, which is a lack of addressing. So they're developing a seven digit code uh, to give each house an address. So in most of Sub-Saharan Africa, there are no addresses. So if you wanna call a pizza, you say, hey, it's the yellow house with the black gate behind the tree, et cetera. And he's working to solve it, and they just want a tender to give addresses to all the houses in Liberia. No, I said pizza, think ambulance. Uh, this is like life changing. And the other guy I want to mention, he was on the Forbes uh, Africa list. His name is uh, Sydney Sam, and he runs Workspace Global, and he's trying to create a creative and advertising agency for African creatives. And it's like a one stop shop. You go on the website, and they give you a full package of services. OK. 
can I can I sneak in a couple Please more? Continue. Okay. <laughs> I had the chance to remember. So one is Lola Odelola, who I'm pretty sure runs Shiri Studio, which is something that's kind of new and upcoming and a creative studio um, that has a lot of ethics behind it, which I like. Um, and then there's Anne-Maria Maffedon, who, if you don't know, please get to know her. She's a genius. She also runs STEMETS, which is a not-for-profit to get girls into um, various STEM careers. If I haven't remembered you, I'm sorry, but... <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. Um, and, and I think this is a good question to end on. I mean, we have a really great community here of under 30 founders, creators in the audience, um, which is brilliant. And still, in terms of funding and resources, for example, black creators um, and, and founders are still lagging behind their white peers for reasons uh, beyond our control. Um, so, you know, if we're able to discuss this with our brilliant community, I think it's a great um, discussion to have. These founders building the businesses of the future, what advice would you have for them in terms of working to diversify their workforce, the people that they hire, not just um, at junior levels, but in the C-suite on their boards? How can they be actively and proactively making a difference to diversify their businesses. Um, and Michael, if you want to start. Okay, so I think uh, you should view African entrepreneurs, look at their resume and you might think, oh, it might not be that impressive. But let me tell you something. A guy who started a company in Nigeria needs to get their own electricity, needs to get their own water. If they work in Lagos, their employees take three and a half hours in traffic to get to work and back. If somebody made a company successful, even in a small scale at that level, they can run a huge company in the West without those hindrances. So I think re-examining uh, experience in context uh, is very important. Okay, um, I'm very glad you mentioned C-suite. I think if you diversify at C-suite, it's quite easy as you go down. And if you're starting a company, you don't have very m many employees. Um, Investing the time in looking at different sources, a lot of the organizations that I just mentioned actually have their own job boards and um, reach out to certain communities. It's much easier if you start um, from the top and go down. Um, but even if you're bigger and you're like, oh no, whoops, we have a problem, uh, you know, treat people as human beings and uh, make sure everyone's paid the same, irrespective of um, gender or race, um, and be quite accountable with that. Some startups actually publish um, all the demographics of their employees and um, differences between them. So that's something to think about if you're really serious about it. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much, Michael and Tolu Lopez. It's been great to have you. And thank you yeah. for having me. Thank you, Isabel.